right, good evening and a very warm welcome to the Blavatnik School of Government. We're really delighted here to host um, a book launch this evening. And for those of you who haven't seen it, this is the book. It's called My Majorities, Minorities, and the Future of Nationhood. And it's edited by Liev Orgad and Ruth Kopmans. There's Ruth Kopmans is sitting here right next to me. And um, as well as a couple of contributors, Eric Kaufman, Yuli Tamir, and David Goodhart, who we hope is on his way. Um, and and uh, myself as well. So this book um, aims to make an intervention into a really important topic. It has escaped nobody in this room that we have seen the rise of nationalism in really every corner of the world, in Brazil, in India, in Israel, the United Kingdom, the United States. So it's a really important time to have a discussion about the role of majorities and minorities. And this book does that. And it does that actually, I think, in a way that is, um, that's increasingly rare. And that is, it's composed of people who disagree with each other, um, sometimes strongly, but always respectfully, I think. And that's, um, that's uh, what we wanna do here tonight is to have a discussion about the important points of agreement as well as important points of difference. So the first thing I'm gonna do is, is turn it over to Ruud, who's gonna give us a quick summary of what the book says. And then we're gonna have a general discussion. Uh, I'll post some questions to, to the rest of the group, and then we'll, we'll turn to take your questions. So without any further ado, Ruud, floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, uh, Maya. So uh, I'll start with, uh, with a series uh, of questions which uh, illustrate what, uh, what the book is about. So can schools in Berlin require German to be spoken in the schoolyard during breaks? And if so, on what grounds? Can social welfare payments for burqa wearers be reduced because they are unemployable, as was a court case in the Netherlands? Are burqa bans legitimate? And if so, in which context and on which grounds? And if not so, what makes the burqa then different from, uh, for instance, blackface traditions? Should linguistic minorities of immigrant origins, such as Turks in Germany, receive the same linguistic rights as national minorities, such as the Danes in Germany? This is a demand by Turkish uh, organizations in, uh, in Germany. Um, should religions of immigrant origin be treated on a par with native or indigenous uh, uh, religions? Is preferential treatment for institutions such as the Church of England still something that can be maintained nowadays in liberal democracies. Should statues of national heroes and historical figures be removed because minorities find them ob objectionable? Can states demand language uh, profici proficiency for access to permanent residence and citizenship? Are states allowed to make cultural proximity a criterion for migration rights. Some countries have that, such as Spain for people from uh, the former colonies in Latin America. Uh, Israel, of course, is also uh, a case in point. And even should Scotland or Catalonia be allowed to decide on independence by themselves? And if, if not so, why? Is that to protect, to protect minorities within these regions? Or is this a majority right of the United Kingdom uh, or Spain. So Liev Orgat, uh, who I have to excuse today, uh, he tried to make it here, but uh, because he also had a presentation uh, this morning in Florence, he unfortunately missed the play. <laughs> so I'll try to uh, make up for that. Um, so Liev Orgat and I set out uh, to bring together leading scholars on these questions on the basis of five assumptions that we had about uh, ethnocultural majorities. The first and a very important one is that these, these cultural majorities need to be defined and seen in the barbarian sense of communities with a subjective belief in a common descent and a common destiny. So they are not referring to racial groups, uh, a distinction that also Max Weber himself uh, explicitly um, uh, made. And we're also not talking here about majorities in the in the purely numeric sense, because numeric uh, majorities and democracies can be very heterogeneous 
and uh, the, the nature of a particular majority need not be cultural uh, at all. Secondly, that cultural majorities are imbued, uh, imbued with the same fundamental rights uh, as cultural minorities are, and that they therefore have a need and a right to strive to maintain a coherent, intergener intergenerationally transmitted societal culture, as Will Kimlicka, who is also one of the contributors to our book, um, has uh, formulated it. So the idea is that where there are rights for cultural minorities, there should logically uh, and also normatively also be rights for cultural majorities. Thirdly, that as a result of the post-World War II minority rights revolution, which of course had very good grounds in the oppression of minorities by majorities in the preceding uh, period, that as a result of this minority uh, revolution, nation states, in, at least in, uh, in, uh, among Western liberal democracies, not uh, so much or not at all in the rest of the world, one should say, but at least in uh, Western liberal nation states, they have increasingly come to be defined in universalist terms. To define nation states in any other way than by reference to universal liberal values has become incre increasingly illegitimate. The terms British, Danish, or Dutch have come to mean only something formal, such as the people that reside in a certain place or the people that have uh, a certain nationality. They no longer refer, at least not in uh, legitimate uh, political discourse, to an ethnocultural group. And the, uh, the notion of Dutchness or Danishness is defined in terms of diversity rather than unicity. Fourthly, that when we recognize the existence of cultural majorities, we need to make a similar fundamental distinction as the one we make among minorities, namely between groups that are indigenous, national, native, or whatever label you want to put on it, um, on the one hand, so native on the one hand, and on the other hand, groups that are of immigrant origin. This is again a distinction that comes from uh, Will Kimlicka, where it comes to uh, minority groups. Um, but we uh, feel that this needs to be, this distinction also needs to be made uh, when we're dealing with cultural majority groups. Um, and there are two reasons for this, or at least two reasons. Uh, one is that indigenous majorities have an attachment to a particular place on earth, to a particular land and landmarks on it, and to the particular history of that particular uh, piece of land. And secondly, that in the case of majorities that are not uh, of, uh, not of uh, native or indigenous origin, so it's just the, uh, the, the majority in America or in Canada or in Australia, they have um, a societal culture in the country of origin um, that is already protected. So there is no, just as there is no need for uh, the German state to protect Turkish culture because they're, you know, the Turkish literature, Turkish, hist Turkish history, etc. There's a country called Turkey that takes care of that. Um, Whereas that is, of course, not the case for, for instance, Kurds uh, in Turkey. They have no other place uh, than Turkey or Iraq also, but they're, they're oppressed as well. But that's a group that only has, uh, um, uh, can also only find protection for its uh, societal culture in um, that region. And therefore, one cannot, and that this, is, this is unfortunately very often the case in the debate on majority and minority rights, the generalizations are made from the context of countries such as Canada uh, to, for instance, the European context. Uh, and we felt uh, that, uh, that this was uh, something that distorted the debates and did not really do justice uh, to the situation in Europe. And fifthly and finally, that the delegitimation of my majority cultures as bearers of rights has relegated the advancement of the interests of cultural minor majorities to the political margins. And that this is one of the main drivers of the rise of right-wing populism and nationalism recently. And as a result, majority nationalism has been resurging in recent years in liberal democracies worldwide in its ugly and intolerant forms. 
We believe, as editors of this volume, that the way to respond to this challenge is not to avoid the debates or to, to stigmatize claims for majority rights even more, but to develop an, an, an analytical and normative framework that allows us to define which type of minority rights and claims are normatively defendable, under which conditions, and which such claims need to be rejected, and on which grounds they need to be rejected. We have Orgat and I are extremely happy and proud that we have been able to bring together a world-class set of scholars to reflect on the issues of majorities, minorities, and the future of nationhood. And we are also proud, and Maya already referred to that, that the book is truly diverse in the range of opinions and perspectives that it offers on the topic, and that in spite of this great variance of opinions, and in spite of the intrinsic normativity of the topic, the debate in the book <clears throat> breeds an atmosphere of pluralistic to to tolerance and a genuine interest in finding common ground. And I hope we can find that also today. So um, finally, uh, some words uh, of uh, thanks, of course, to the book contributors um, who have come here today. Um, then to um, John Haslam, um, our publisher, Robert Judkins, uh, who has been in charge uh, of the production of the book in uh, the last year or so, and also the other marvelous staff at uh, Cambridge University Press. Then, of course, to the Lovatic School of Government for hosting us today. And finally, to Maya for organizing today's event. And with that, I okay. pass the floor. And I should you. say one more thanks, because this has been also sponsored, not just by, this, by the Blavatnik School, but by the Alfred Landek Foundation. So the first question, that I'm going to start by posing it to Yuli, but then asking Eric and Mudu to come in on this issue is um, the question of what a majority actually is. So many of the contributions in the volume talk about majority rights versus minority rights. And they begin with the intervention that the core problem in a democracy has been the protection of minority rights because democracy can become quickly a tyranny of the majority. But that majority is defined in democratic terms, right? So it's, it's a numerical majority. It's majority in virtue of numbers. Um, and this book, I think, in many ways, there, where some of the, vol the chapters speak past each other, it's, about, it's on this definition of what is a majority and what rights are given to groups in virtue of me being a majority. So I wondered if you would say a little bit about what you think how, how, what is your definition of a majority? Um, and what's a specific example of a minority, of a majority right? Okay, thank you. And thank you, Ruth and Liaz, for, for this is a continuation of the conversation we had in Berlin, what, three years ago? Yeah, 2019. Yep. Yeah. So uh, it's actually an on, a work in progress, I think, and we're all uh, thinking about these issues. Um, and I think the biggest contribution of, uh, to begin with Liav and then Ruth's work about majorities is to uh, define the fragility of majorities. So it is true that majority is usually defined in numerical terms, but in nation states, majorities had um, seen as being able to protect their identity in a democratic way that is not questionable. So if you want everyone to speak your language or to preserve the culture or to celebrate uh, the historical narrative, that seemed to be an easy thing to do because you just bring it to public debate and win the debate. So there was this assumption that injustice in democratic terms is a case where a group, usually a minority, loses out on a debate time after time because they have no way to win the debate. Now, the, the important debate about minority rights created situations that challenge this description. And I think this is where our common sort of a, a questioning uh, emerged from. If the majority right is restricted in order to respect the minority, what's the right balance? What is the right balance between the majority and the minority, the right to preserve a certain culture, uh, 
and the duty to respect the needs and preferences of the minority. So the, I don't think the definition of the majority changed, but our rights between majority and minorities changed. And that is, I think, the biggest question of all right now. Um, majorities in many parts of the world feel threatened. And since they feel threatened, they would like to have means to protect themselves. The interesting thing, and that I think is something to be considered, is that many of these fears are not present day fears, they are future oriented fears. And what are you allowed to do in order to present to preserve a future state of affair is something that political theory didn't really reflect upon. So a lot of people are not actually worried about right now, but they are worried about a slippery slope procedure where I'm here now, I let this happen, and then it all runs out of control. And the question is, when can you sort of, when do you have a right to stop this process in order to avoid uh, a process of, of slippery slope uh, processes? So that's, I think, is the, and it's true in Israel, it's true. I, I just read that there was a, a, a recent a survey in the United Kingdom, and it turned out that the Christians are now no longer a majority. So should the Anglican church be preserved as a state church? That, that's the kind, now people, you know, start asking themselves this question when they feel uh, that their situation as a majority is not absolutely sort of uh, certain for the future. So they start wondering about the future state of affair. And this is, I think, where the debate becomes really interesting. Eric. Yeah, um, thanks, thanks, Maya. And by the way, uh, Rude and Leah, what a, what a job in putting together this book, which is, is really unique and distinct, I think, in the, the, the breadth of the perspectives that it contains. Really, I haven't seen anything like it in political theory. Um, so yeah, in terms of majorities, well, just some statistics to begin with, since I tend to do a lot of this. I mean, so 70% of the world's countries have an ethnic majority. And if we include countries that have a 40% or plus plurality, that's 80% of the world. So it's this, sort of the norm in the world, even though there are essentially no countries that are 100% homogenous. Um, so this is a kind of norm. Now, the question is only in certain parts of the world are we, are we seeing significant ethnic change that's predominantly in the West. Not only, there are a few places like Ivory Coast and so forth. But um, so you know, the issue is, what are we talking about with a majority? My uh, doctoral supervisor, Anthony D. Smith at the LSE, recently deceased or, or deceased uh, a few years ago, had this idea of concept of the ethnic core. These are communities of shared ancestry that give rise to the modern nation state. So you have an, a, an, a French ethne. Now, granted, there are regional distinctions and then a French nation state, which draws a lot of its symbolism from that ethnic core, but the core doesn't just disappear, it's still there. You still have an ethnic majority. Now it may be assimilative, certainly is assimilative at the edges, but um, the question then is, as that ethnic majority shrinks in societies that are undergoing ethnic change, if assimilation isn't rapid enough, um, the question then becomes, you know, uh, what sort of rights does it have? And I think that's sort of what this book attempts to come to grips with. I mean, one of the points that I make in, the, in my chapter is that um, political theorists such as Kimlicka and Taylor, and the, a lot of the political theory that has come in the wake of, of Kimlicka's work and Taylor's work has gone with this assumption that because the national identity, the so-called societal culture, reflects the ethnic majority, so Christmas is a holiday period, for example, uh, or, or Sunday as, 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 a, as a day of rest or whatever, um, because of that, Therefore, the ethnic majority is taken care of and we can move on and just deal with minorities. I think the problem here is that, that the traditional political theory deals with culture in terms of holidays and in terms of practices, but it, what it doesn't deal with is identity in terms of uh, myths of ancestry. So the myths of ancestry of nation states in the West are polyglot, multicultural polyglot myths, not 
the myths of ancestry of the ethnic majority. So the culture, yes, the culture is the official language of the ethnic majority, the holidays, et cetera, but the identity is not that of the ethnic majority. So the, the question then becomes, what do we do about the recognition of ethnic majorities as ethnic majorities? So Charles Taylor talks about the politics of recognition. That's recognition for minorities, but there's no actual recognition for ethnic majorities as ethnic majorities in this nation, which may bear the stamp of their culture, but doesn't bear their identity. Rude, would you like to add? Let me see. Yeah, it's on. Uh, it's on already. Yeah, yeah. So I've, I've said a bit about it already, of course. Um, I think the demographic ch uh, challenge that both Eric and uh, and Julie talk about is is one one of the issues that makes the the issue of majority rights um, high on the agenda these days. The other is indeed this rights revolution. And so the 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 the, the principle that Julie referred to that you know in the, in let's say the pre nineteen sixties period, the issue just didn't pose itself because. The cultural, the historical, ethno-cultural majorities were at the same time also numeric majorities. Nowadays, that's not that's not just a question of the future. I think it's something that's already there, and it's and it's also worrying people uh, for developments in the present. Not on the national level. There's there's not a single uh, nation state. I mean, the United States is <laughs> going in that direction uh, rapidly, but. Certainly in Europe, there's not a single nation state where the, the historical majority is threatening to become the numeric minority. But of course, if you uh, take into account that immigrants are very heavily concentrated in certain regions and cities, then in certain cities in Europe, uh, which includes many capital cities, such as Amsterdam, for instance, the historical majority is no longer uh, the majority, nor is there any other majority because the rest of the population of immigrant origin is very heterogeneous. So it's not that, that there's sort of a replacement uh, group of Muslims or whatever who take over that role, but the historical majority is no longer uh, the majority in, in actually all the four largest cities in the Netherlands and in many cities in Germany, many cities in France, and probably also many cities in the United Kingdom. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one thing, not to, not to speak of neighborhoods where they started already, of course, in the 1970s or 1960s even. And these are, of course, also things that worry people that, you know, I, I, you know, looking back at the history of my family, they are from a, a particular neighborhood in Amsterdam, the Jordaan, a working class neighborhood that almost everybody has moved out there and, and the population has been com completely replaced. And this is also a self-propelling process because you know, at the more the group becomes, feels itself to be in a minority state, the, 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 the more people move away and the more this process is reinforced. So I think on the local and regional level, it's already, it's already uh, happening. And the second thing is the rights revolution. Uh, that's also something that undermines this uh, coupling of historical majority to numeric majority, because even in many cases where the, the historical cultural majority through parliamentary decisions on the national or on the local level actually wants to implement something, for instance, certain restrictions of um, uh, asyl asylum migration or certain requirements to uh, uh, residents or the example that I mentioned, the court case about uh, the Amsterdam local government who wanted uh, to cut the welfare uh, stipend or the social welfare payments to a woman who was wearing full face covering, full burqa, so you can even see the eyes, so you know, really uh, the Afghan way. Of course, no employer wanted to take uh, hire that woman, uh, and um, the um, they wanted to, uh, it was actually a, a Muslim uh, alderman who was uh, responsible for uh, social affairs, who is now the mayor of Rotterdam, Ahmed Abu Taleb. He uh, wanted, to, wanted to cut uh, the social welfare payments for this woman, and there were a couple of others in this uh, Salafist community in uh, Amsterdam. The woman went to court and she won her case. It was deemed to be discrimination, and, and the local government was forced to. And of course, this was something that had widespread support. It had even had widespread support within the Muslim community in this case, uh, and still it didn't happen because um, 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 the, 
the claimant in case could successfully appeal to courts, which referred to minority rights and which made this, um, this huge majority decision undone. So I think that's the second challenge, the rights revolution and indeed these demographic changes. And both of them, by the way, explain why this is concentrated in, in Western countries. Uh, because we are the we are the 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 the, 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 the targets of uh, the migration flows that lead to these demographic changes. Plus, we have demographic decline of our own populations. So these two also uh, combine together. And also, we are the only part of the world, uh, together with a few states in East Asia, maybe in Latin America, that actually sticks to all these international human, human rights uh, treaties, because much of the rest of the world take uh, the country where the World Cup is hosted right now, Qatar has also cited many of these international treaties, but they, they don't give a, they don't give a shit <laughs> um, because there's no enforcement mechanism. So I think that combination leads to this problem appearing, especially within uh, Western liberal democracies. So I have one more question, uh, which I'm gonna put to all of you, and then I'm gonna open it up for questions. Um, and that is the question that I think probably means in the minds of lots of people listening to us, which is um, when, when does, the protection of minor, of majority rights, or let's say we take it for granted that there is something that we all should be thinking about, majority rights, majority rights, for example, to language protection. So a national language, one can require people to speak a national language that doesn't mean that one can't have multiple national languages. And as someone who studies India, you know, it is a country that has lots of national languages. Um, so, so how does one think about where protection of majorities bleeds over into downright illiberalism, right? And is that when does that become problematic? So, you know, we talked, Yuli, you talked about demographic transitions. You know, in India today, Muslims are no more than a quarter of the population. Um, and I think that there has been a real debate in India about whether things, there are certain, um, you know, one, uh, concessions that have been made to religious minority groups at the moment of the nation's creation in India. And one of those that has been, I think, perhaps where the needle has really moved is the creation of a, of a uniform civil code. So there are different codes for legal codes um, uh, for Muslims in India. And um, there has been, I think, a majority of opinion now moving, suggesting that maybe that's not, not the right thing to have. But no one can deny that today what is happening in India is a deprivation of minority rights. So how do you think about where to draw the line there between where majority rights it goes from a consideration of, of protection, of culture, of, of the feeling um, recognized and seen to something that becomes um, really downright dangerous for minorities? So Eric, I'm going to start with you today. Sure. So, yeah, it's a very good question. Um, I, I, I think we, we have to make a distinction between, um, and this is in the psychology literature, there's a very important distinction between attachment to own group and dislike of out group, and that these things are generally not correlated. And I'll give you an example of this. In the US, there's the American National Election Study, which is kind of the gold standard political science survey that asks people how they feel towards different groups. And if you take a white American and you ask them how warm they are in a zero to 100 thermometer to white people, and then you ask them how warm or cool they are to black people and Hispanic people, whites who are warmer towards white people are actually slightly warmer towards black people and Hispanic people. So there isn't this zero sum. The way it's often portrayed is that these things are flip sides of the same coin. Now, on the other hand, People who are very warm towards the Republicans are very cool towards the Democrats and vice. So that's a zero sum relationship, but the racial one is not. And this is very, this is, and the psych literature, literature is a paper by Marilyn Brewer on in-group love, uh, which is very much emphasizes this. And so I think the problem we're seeing in Western countries is an attempt, and this isn't actually being done by minorities, it's being done by the sort of ethnic majority cultural left. This is sort of the group that is driving most of this. And what they are trying to do is delegitimate the ethnic majority identity. And so they're going after statues, they're going after history, 
uh, they are not recognizing majority concerns or identities and stigmatizing those as racist. It's not minorities that are doing that, actually. Um, now, this, I think, is sort of a, a, the major axis of conflict. It's not really necessarily about recognizing whether minorities have the right to wear certain... I mean, of course, that's an issue, but I don't think that's the, the core issue. I think the core issue we see as the battle over, for example, the teaching of history in schools, to say that you know, Britain is a country founded on racism, I teach that to kids. You know, that's the kind of example of what I'm talking about. In these symbolic issues, um, there's no question that I think there is no real respect being paid to the sensitivities of, let's say, high identifying members of majority groups. Whereas would they go in and, and sort of talk about, I don't know, Pakistani British identity and start running down the Mughal empire for being genocidal and all. I mean, there just isn't that same attention to uh, minority groups. And I think, so, so what I think is there's a real asymmetry uh, in the way majorities and minorities culture and history is being treated and identity is being treated. Uh, and I think that's one of the drivers behind the kind of polarization we see, as well as of course the immigration issue, which I think is also part of this because it's, it's again a question of if you, there's no question majorities have more of an interest in, in slowing down the rate of change of immigration to allow for assimilation. That is being stigmatized as racist. Again, if you look at that question in political science surveys, the distance between Republicans and Democrats on the immigration question has been widening. It's now 50 points. In Canada, the difference between conservative voters and liberal and new Democrat voters is over 50. You know, so in all these countries, this issue is really dividing that sort of progressive cultural left from the, the sort of more high identifying ethnic majority. Well, I th first of all, this is a very, um, a very sensitive issue because it's really a question of uh, balancing uh, rights and allowing the majority and the minority to coexist. So first of all, I don't think there is one formula. I mean, there's a theoretical formula that could be applied everywhere. We should just find it, you know, sketch it on the board and then implement it. Uh, I think that in the question of majority and minority rights, um, the context is very important. And though it is a very imprecise, imprecise Definition, I should say the minority should have enough of a space to survive with dignity in order for a, a solution to be a just one. So I respect, like Eric, the desire of the majority to retain its identity. It cannot do it in an oppressive way or in a way that undermines or belittles the minority. And here, really, the the, the essence of the of the answer is grounded in in the way you describe what you do. The, the, it's it's a matter of interpretation. I mean, there is a, a difference, like in Israel, between saying um, Arabs are not allowed uh, to build neighborhood uh, to buy houses in a Jewish neighborhood, and saying um, we understand Arabs don't have enough of a room for social and communal development, and we should develop communities uh, for both Jews and Arabs. So the mix, the, the incentive to mix will be uh, less of an escape from your own poor community uh, and more of a choice. So one is like negating the right of Arabs. The other is saying, okay, let's see what kind of rights and what kind of demands they have as citizens. And let's try to balance that with the demands and rights of the majority. So neither is a clean answer. There is a problem with both sides saying, you know, I want to do this. But the balancing, I think basically politics now is about balancing. It's not about, you know, finding the right solution. And in, in the balancing, it's important what is taken into account. And what for me is absolutely crucial is both sides will be taken is into account. I agree with Eric, there were periods that the majority wasn't counted at all because it was seen like obvious, they will naturally defend themselves. Now I think there is more of a work to be uh, made in balancing acts, but still it's the way you do it and the justification you give uh, for each decision. Yeah, no answer. <laughs> 
Yeah, but of, it's of course a correct answer. I mean, yeah, no. it is always a question of balancing. Um, and there's also a boundary, I'll come to that. Um, it's true one always has to look at these things in context, but there's also at least something that one can normatively theorize, and that's what Leaf and I try to do in our um, uh, chapter in the book um, about uh, types of constellations that that one finds in, in several contexts. And that, that I mean, the, the most simple of those is this distinction between is a majority indigenous or is it of immigrant origin? Is the major minority in question indigenous or is it of immigrant origin? And that already leads to, to different normative constellations. So on, on the one hand, you have the constellation where you have a majority uh, of indigenous origin, historical majority, and a minority of immigrant origin. This, we argue, that would be the constellation where the majority claims weigh most heavily compared to the minority claim. The complete opposite of that is where you have a minority that is historically indigenous and a majority that um, it derives from migration. The majority of the United States or of Australia vis-a-vis -vis the Aborigines uh, or uh, the Native Americans would be uh, there. You, we would say that's where the minority has actually the strongest claims when this balancing act needs to be needs to be made between the interests um, of the two. So that um, is one way of at least structuring this a little bit more analytically and not having to decide uh, on a case by case basis. But of course, even you know, even within Europe. Uh, Different countries are different. They have different traditions. France has, in, when we talk about religion, the tradition of laicite, which uh, which is part of, you know, the historical majority's culture. One uh, might say, England has, uh, as many as some other countries, uh, historical state church, which is also tied to the national history, etc., etc., etc. So now, what's the boundary? And that, then I come to your uh, to the to the Indian case. Mm -hmm. The boundary is individual human rights. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the individual rights uh, to non discrimination, uh, the rights uh, to freedom of wor worship, the freedom of expression, etc., equality of men and women, etc. So the, 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 that, I would say, is the limit. That's also where uh, in, the, in the situation in India, if the rights of Muslims are cur cur curtailed to such an extent mm -hmm. that people are discriminated merely because of the fact that they are Muslim, or um, um, that Muslims no longer have the possibility to, to freely worship their religion, uh, then uh, that limit is, is crossed. But the limit is not yet crossed, I would say. It's still a balancing act. I mean, I would, I'm not saying that I'm in favor, but that boundary is not crossed at the moment that India would decide to proclaim itself to be a Hindu nation. And again, one can see that in the context, we have India surrounded by uh, countries that were part of British India that declared themselves to be Muslim uh, nations. And <clears throat> so if India would do that too, it would something would be something that I personally would not, <laughs> would not uh, welcome. But I don't think it would be crossing a boundary. There are many countries around the world that have that, including the United Kingdom as a state church. And if if somehow India would declare Hinduism to be the state religion, and that would be done in such a way that it stays on a mostly symbolic level that does not curtail uh, the religious rights uh, of non-Hindu uh, religious minorities, I think that would still be okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, just, yeah I just wanted to say that for me, um, we should be honest about the fact that once one group uh, gains rights, others are losing rights. It's not like we can preserve everybody's rights equally. I mean, if you live in a, an environment that is not your environment, I mean, coming to Oxford, I was, you know, I grew up in Israel in a Jewish environment. I felt the Christianity of Oxford as imposing discomfort in certain situations. Um, where my fellows uh, would say, well, what do you mean? I said, well, you know, this huge cross in the room. Belial has crosses <laughs> probably in every lecture room, maybe not now, but then. Uh, you know, it's a sense of discomfort. But I realized that I'm a visitor, a minority, 
Um, and, you know, I, I cannot impose my views, but the fact that I respect the right of the majority means that for me, I lose something. So it's not a situation where I, I think there is a win-win situation. We always want to say we can balance it out. Of no, minorities and sometimes majorities in a certain neighborhood are absolutely right. And it's really interesting to think uh, whether sovereignty trickles down to a neighborhood, to a, you know, to a community. I mean, it's the fact that the state is uh, has, is Anglican trickles down all the way to every community or to every public sphere. But I think that we should acknowledge, and this is why we should understand how painful it is. The minority majority relationship are interesting and important because they are always painful. And there is always a loss. I just want to quickly comment. I mean, I think that that can be the case, but I also think there are many situations, and again, from the survey data, we know that minorities will often identify with majority symbols. Um, and so, and even something like identifying with the ethnic composition of the country they knew when they arrived, you know, and this is quite, you know, so, so what I would say is actually there is quite a bit of support even from minorities for some of these majority inflected traditions. Uh, so it's not, and, and on the other hand, we have a lot of significant number of white progressives who are probably the most vociferous opponents of these majority traditions. And so I think it's, again, I, I don't know that it breaks down as much on minority majority grounds as it does on ideological grounds where the left and right ideologies are using majority or minority as symbols of their ideology. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's get some questions from, from you. Who would like to ask a question? David, uh, I'm gonna start with David and then, um, and then I'll come over here. Go ahead. Do we need a mic or there we go? I think we're okay. I'll repeat if, if raise your hand if you can't hear, but. So, um, so I've been wrestling with the, somebody who thinks of themselves as a kind of liberal nationalist. I've been wrestling with the issue about how um, protection of majority cultures can occur within liberal democratic states. I think the issue is somewhat different when you step outside the set of liberal democracies. Um, because, and I think the problem may, may be this, um, that the kinds of mechanisms of cultural reproduction that have occurred over the centuries during which nations have been built, um, including in particular the way that media are used to create images of the nation that are then disseminated throughout. That's, and also, of course, the just person to person reproduction through families and, and so on and so on. But these have tended to be disrupted by globalization, economic and cultural globalization. Uh, and it's very hard to know how a liberal state can respond. To this. So I mean, just take one very one example that I find rather appealing. Um, turns out that in Iceland, um, children's uh, like tablets and iPhones are programmed with English language software. And Iceland is too small a country to have its own sort of software industry creating its own software. And so Icelandic <coughs> children are, are often learning English their first language from their tablets because uh, that's how they're getting their, their first words and so on. So that's a case where, and of course, language is hugely important to Icelandic identity, cultural identity. So that's a case where um, <clears throat> the reproduction of majority cultures over time is being impacted negatively by global forces. And it seems to me the problem there then is that um, liberal states, by their very nature, are going to be reluctant to make the kind of interventions that would actually sort of slow this process down. And so, for example, imagine um, in order to uh, prevent the progressive erosion of national broadcast media, the state was to start banning uh, whatever in, in imported global. Uh, entertainment plans in the name of reproducing national identity. 
we can imagine the would-be kind of outrage response, but also it could be a kind of um, abandonment of liberal values. So, so my, I guess my question is, then, this is a bit of a kind of intervention, but the question is, so what kinds of policies, what, what, are, the, what are the limits today for liberal states in securing the reproduction over time of majority cultures? Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, I think it's a really interesting question, and I, I, I guess my my first response is I I'm not sure the culture of many Western countries is so threatened in the sense that you know the language language is not necessarily the issue. I mean, these these, these generally the waves of immigrants come in, they settle, they learn language. It's it's, it's fairly unproblematic in most cases. Um, and even it's to save you from an English speaking country. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and even the Americanization, and that's it's not what's elicited a lot of the reaction. It's actually the, the, the ethnic change and the loss of um, essentially ethnic preponderance, lack of recognition of ethnic identity, sort of attacks on its history. Yeah, whether that's statues or renaming or, or you know, yeah. what's being taught in schools, these sorts of things. So I think it's, I, I guess I kind of come back to, I think culture and identity are very different. I think the culture is not particularly under threat, I would say generally in these Western countries, but I do think the identity of the ethnic majority is, and that's much more the nub of the, the issue than culture per se. Um, so why don't we go around really briefly? And then I think because there were lots of hands, let's let's gather some questions and then we'll go around. Yeah, but just on this case, since who do you wanna? Well, just uh, <laughs> I actually I actually agree with uh, with David that this that this is uh, an important uh, dimension. I actually thought of also raising it in my uh, in my five minutes, but I thought okay, that's but of course that is part part of the issue, especially for smaller nation states, is that there is this there is this not, not only this demographic challenge, not only the rights revolution challenge, but also the globalization challenge, which has nothing to do with immigration, by the way, or to some extent by with a very different type of immigration of expats and tourists. If you go um, in, in Amsterdam, for instance, in many shops, uh, and bars in the in the center, you cannot order in Dutch anymore, and it's now happening in Berlin too. And that's that, and and that of course uh, also that makes sort of the um, um, sort of keeping the language intact and maintaining the language an issue that then is sort of resolved where it can be easy when it can be where it can be most easily resolved and that's in relation to immigrants who may not even in this case not even be the the, the greatest threat but it's very difficult uh, to impose dutch uh, as a language on expat, expats because they wouldn't come anymore <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah, and and Dutch universities also, right? Also, increasingly, yeah, the master's, master's the, programs are totally increasingly, yeah, days, yeah, which means that you know, uh, even cultural studies, history, uh, it's all Dutch language English. departments are closing down. Yeah. There are no students anymore, so that is a problem for rep reproduction of culture. Um, well, the oven, I had a, an idea to write this paper, which we didn't, uh, <laughs> called "Killing Them Softly." And thinking about tools that kills nations softly, like you know, allowing people to immigrate, uh, producing products in an, another language, um, and English, and um, you know, the media temptation and the market are strong forces that allow more opportunities in a in a different environment than your own, than your sort of national environment. And here, I think the biggest question is really, and this is really a big question liberals, I think, um, are too minded about, is um, whether we should refrain from paternalism and allow people to make their choices. OK, I want to teach my children English because I think the global market is uh, then open to them, and then they have more opportunities. And you know, I'm ready to do that. They are ready to do that or as much choice as children have. So um, this is not against the right of the nation that I will opt out. And there's a lot of opting out now, or a lot of mixture of people moving from one place to another and adopting 
a new vari variation of their nationalism or actually just living because of all sorts of reasons. Um, and this is the end, this is our, these are the boundaries of my own nationalism. I think that if nations want to give up, uh, give up their language, give up their rights, uh, open up, change their identity and so on, they have the right to do it. Nationalism cannot be identified with stagnation and conservatism because na healthy nations develop and they always change. Not, no one is identical to where they have been a while ago. And if this change leads, sort of is a leeway out of your own nationalism into something else, I think it is, would be very dangerous to say to people, no, you can't make this choice. You can't, you can't force the choice, but you can't also, but you cannot force not to make the choice to opt out. And this, the right to exit here is very important that nationalism um, will remain a liberal force. And that actually makes, it puts a lot of burden on people who want to preserve the nation to work hard to make it worthwhile for people to remain members. Um, that's not an easy, if you force them, it's the easy choice. If you work hard to make it uh, valuable, that's the hard choice, but also the more uh, valuable one for me. I think, I think one of the thing, interesting things here is that um, it's tempting to think that that, that, is a, that having a state make a paternalistic entry point into the nature of Netflix provision, that that's paternalism. But, but of course, you're already on the slippery slope because you decide what language to teach in state schools, you decide what history to tell in state schools. And if you don't tell a history and have a common set of languages at least to, to share, then, um, then the very idea of nationhood um, begins to erode, right? So, okay, there were some questions here. So let me, let me put like a few together. Is there's a danger, I think, in treating minorities as static and as monolithic. Um, 20 years ago, there was a very live controversy in Birmingham where a play was supposed to be put on, which was about violence within a Sikh home. And there was a lot of noise about attacks on, there were some attacks actually on, on the theater um, and threats to, to, to widen that. And the Chief Constable took the decision essentially to say to the, the people running the theater, don't put it on, we can't provide you protection. He, I actually talked to him about, about this at the time. Um, he took this decision after consulting what were seen to be the leaders of that community. Only it turns out that was actually not at all a representative voice in particular, the younger generation, a lot of the women were very much against that view. Now, I bet if we go back 20 years now, it would be different because there's been a generational change. And I suspect that one of the problems with putting it in the way some of you have is the minority, majority and minority distinction is frozen in time. And it's not allowing for evolution. And particularly, and this point has come up a bit, your story about the, uh, the Muslim mayor who was trying to stop the woman wearing the hijab. Um, it, you get breaks within the uh, minority community itself, both generational and, I suspect, class. So I think we've got to see this much more complex, than, which leads me on to the question I wanted to put to you, which is a lot of these things don't stay at the level of political theory. In fact, they really get interesting when they become legal. At least I'm a lawyer, so I say this, but they become legal cases, a lot of which have ended up in the European Court of Human Rights, and in the national courts in a number of countries, this, um, this country particularly, but also I think in France, does it help or does it make it worse when these issues are translated into questions of legal principle as opposed to political accommodation? I'm very curious what your views are. Before you want to answer, let me take a few more questions. Joe. Joe. That's it. Sorry comment rather than a question, I guess, but uh, you know. So um, as you were all talking, I realized there are a number of different things that could be meant by majority rights, and they're not the same thing. <clears throat> the right of majority. So, so one is um, the rights of those people who happen to be in the majority. The second is the right to be a majority. 
And the third is the type of the privilege of uh, what Eric called the ethnic core. And it seems to me these are, the, the first question is a perfectly legitimate question to raise whatever your political view is. <clears throat> what are the rights of the people who happen to be in the majority? Are they being neglected? But the idea that there is a right for the majority to remain the majority is a separate question. And whether those who are in the majority should have some type of privilege over those who are not in the majority is yet another question. And it, it just seems to me we have to keep these apart because there's a danger in both directions of, of collapsing. Yeah, all right. Helpful intervention. Um, Ralph. I hadn't really thought so much of this majority minority question in terms of, or indeed of populism in terms of culture so much. I mean, I hear a lot of culture, symbolism, attachment and so on. And what if we were to take a slightly different view? Populism has also been explained as welfare chauvinism. So to what extent is this a question not of culture so much, but of politics? And if you take a kind of political road, then you could say things like welfare rights kind of come down to who has the right to receive pensions or money for schooling and, and, and. Or you could say political rights dissolve into things like how many skills do you bring and on what basis are you granted citizenship? So these are political rights. And if we could diffuse it into those kinds of very concrete rights, you know, would these issues of culture and <laughs> plural secular <coughs> state go away? Now, the only final point is that the only place that I've heard so far where it wouldn't go away is this burqa wearing person. But of course, that would also go away if you translated it into, you know, what kind of jobs could and should that person be allowed to have and under what circumstances is it discrimination to either prevent having a job or to prevent <coughs> welfare? But again, that seems to me to be a way of diffusing the issue and, and by not talking about culture so much as politics. Okay, I'll take one more question and then we'll come back to the panel. Yes. The thing that bothers me <laughs> is authoritarian countries where the, um, of, of a very stable majority, sees fairly small minorities as a threat and seems sort of frightened of them. And I mean, I have to think of Turkey and China, really. Um, but uh, can you defuse those um, feelings? Can, can you, is, how do you check that? Thank you. Two, two questions about the thinking about politics. One about the, the whether it helps or hurts that you move into the legal sphere, but when you move from politics into the legal sphere, how you think this last question about, um, I think this is another version of the India question, right? Think about countries that are authoritarian or either moving in the authoritarian direction where um, they feel threatened by quite small majorities um, and a question of whether we can't just all reframe this in terms of welfare rights. So Yuli, let me start with you. You can take, take uh, what you'd like. I just start with the last question because I think David's uh, paper about the uh, minarets in Switzerland shows that uh, fears of a non-existing threat, like Muslim taking over uh, the Swiss, uh, and the, the yeah the the the, the Swiss landscape. Um, it happens not only in authoritarian countries. It, it is actually widespread in many, many places. Um, so um, it is, I think, one of the things that thinking about nationalism leads to is to uh, tie more strongly political theory to psychology. And I think this is something that uh, is extremely important. It's not all about just the legal aspect of things. It's about the way people feel about those things. And the legal debate often actually uh, structure the debate in ways that uh, undermine, sorry, undermines the importance of the emotional aspect of things. And, and therefore, I think sometimes if 
the matter is debated in non-legal terms, uh, it is easier to reach a solution. The legal, uh, at least in the cases I know of, a lot of the legal debates uh, make a very structured decision, but not necessarily sensitive to the feelings of the people involved. I think, for example, uh, the, 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 actually the example you raised, uh, didn't ask the question of what do people in the community, what do women, sorry, in the community feel? And uh, the women in the community may feel uh, sometimes have surprising uh, understanding of what is necessary to protect the community. And um, sometimes may not want to be forced to do things that you think are for, it's going again to the question of paternalism, what is good for them, Whereas their own judgment or their own limited judgment because of the pressures around them will be different. So um, since I said it's all about balancing, I think the court is not always so good at balancing. And very often it leads to uh, decisions that leave minorities actually offended and offended at the same time. Yeah, let me let me react to the to the first question. Um, so you said these things become uh, usually most interesting when they reach the courts. I I would contest that. Not that it's not interesting when they reach the courts. These are usually interesting cases, but it's only a small tip of the iceberg of the cases that actually go to courts. And that's also actually not only true for issues that deal with majority rights, but also minority rights issues. So I think that's also maybe important to, to clarify that the way in which we talk, most of us in the book about majority rights is not necessarily in terms of legally inscribed rights. It is, it's also about norms, which of course are often uh, tied to, in the case of minority rights, they tie to international conventions, which are often also very uh, liberally defined in such a way that when it comes to the European Court of Human Rights, then many, many different interpretations of different nation states are, are then deemed to be uh, admissible by, by the European Court. Um, so I think it's important to think of this thing, uh, these majority rights uh, as in the case of minority rights, also in terms of, of norms and of recognition. I think it, it would already be a large way uh, towards um, uh, a resolution of these, these tensions if we would achieve a situation where even speaking about rights of the historical, cultural majority or the ethnocultural poor or whatever becomes something legitimate to say in in these balancing uh, discussions uh, with minor minority rights, because this is not necessarily always the case. In in um, the chapter by by Leo Van and, uh, and me, we cite um, a, a speech by the current Dutch Queen when she was still uh, crown princess, um, where she, she comes from Argentina, so she married the current king. And uh, when after, after she'd been in the Netherlands for a couple of years, she gave, gave a speech on national identity and said, you know, I've been here now for a couple of years. And if you would ask me about Dutch national identity, I think it doesn't exist. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and that is, that, that is something said by a member, by the, a member of the highest part of the elite, but it's something that is in, in sort of intellectual circles very common to say Dutch national identity doesn't exist. Whereas if you ask people on the street or even in, 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 in surveys, people are actually very well able to identify uh, uh, elements. And it's not just language, it goes to certain aspects of history, uh, certain uh, traditions, uh, like Santa Claus, our Santa Claus. Uh, so people are the large majorities mention in an open in an open question. Eh? They mention them as aspects of national culture. So if you already have the recognition that there is such uh, a thing uh, as Dutch or Danish culture, and that the Danes and the Dutch actually exist as an as an ethno ethnocultural group, and that we need to balance the the legitimate claims slash rights 
of that of that group with the claims of immigrant groups, and that is not just uh, a majority group group that is obliged obliged only to embrace diversity and forget about itself. I think then we're already a long way uh, to a resolution, and we're also already a long way. I think then in undermining the discourse of the populist right, because currently they have the monopoly on saying, yes, there is such a thing as the Danes and the Dutch. Yeah, no, I, I think I would largely essentially agree with Rude's point that I think this is largely normative rather than legal. I think the legal part, and even I would say the rights part, I think this is much more about you know, the ability to make political claims and to have those accommodated and adjudicated um, <laughs> um, right. So, yeah. So, for example, I think a lot of what's a lot of what's going on now revolves around the uh, what the psychologist Nick Haslam calls the concept creep of terms such as prejudice, trauma, etc. So, for example, especially the term racism. It has been an ideological project of the cultural left to expand the meaning of the term racism, to take more and more debates off the table, to make it in, sort of not possible to talk about reducing immigration levels, to make it impossible to talk about ethnic majority identities, to make it impossible, you know, and, and to start to try and essentially problematize any aspect of national history that can be associated with the ethnic majority. So. Um, I think that's the main thrust. Again, I, say, I don't think it's coming from minorities. It's coming from the cultural left, which has gained power substantially since the mid-1960s, has attempted to expand this notion of racism and trauma outward. So, for, for example, even saying um, anybody can make it in America is now seen to be a quote-unquote microaggression that is going to impact on historically marginalized groups. So always pushing for more and more and more fine-grained sensitivities, which has the effect of, of course, shutting down and erasing the possibility for ethnic majorities to have their identity and to express their uh, political desires. So it might be for re reduction in immigration. So this is not really about rights so much as the normative ability to make political claims to espouse identities. I think that is really where the battleground is. Not as much over rights, even though I accept that certain things like minarets and burqas and so on, but I don't think that is the main thrust of what's going on and what's driving the polarized climate. So we, um, we're, we're technically supposed to stop, but because we have welcomed David um, um, just now, I, I'm going to suggest that if you need to go, you can go. We, obviously, we're, we're, um, we'll, we'll go until, until six. So are there, are there more questions that we have out there, people? Yes. Um, so let me take you first, and then we'll come here. Yes, please. Yeah, so... The entire time we've been talking about majorities and minorities, and what been, I don't think we've considered the idea that how how majorities and minorities view each other. Because very often, I think you mentioned that, um, for example, whites who have strong feelings with whites as well have strong feelings with other other ethnicities as well. And I think it's because perhaps a lot of these issues arise only when majorities and minorities see each other as locked in a sort of zero sum game, and uh, Switzerland works, for example, because even though there's a majority and minority, the ethnic groups can work with each other. There's not that much antagonism within themselves. And only when there's an inherent antagonism between majorities and minorities do these problems arise. And it's not possible to work them out by consensus or by discussion. And this becomes a sort of violent clash of them. Um, some of this has been covered, but I, I, I wanted to ask how much this is a battle of power and resources, which is a little bit to the point about welfareism, which I don't think you you, you answered fully. Um, I can remember when I was a student of um, democracy, they used to say that the true test of a democratic nation was how well they treated minorities. And I, I think that your book is incredibly timely and, and very helpful because you unpack that and, and complicate it in, 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 in the best traditions. Um, so I'm just wondering whether this is um, a, a battle about resources, but using using some of the cultural features as as symbols, um, 
almost reminds me of the battle that must have happened when the Reformation occurred in Europe. You know, of course, that was a battle of ideas, but it was also a battle about the rise of the gentry, kind of taking, and, and it's a new kind of outsider group with migrants in it. But some migrants are incredibly successful and other migrants are incredibly unsuccessful. I mean, they're, they're both, both extremes. And I, I, there's another complicating factor for me. I mean, I'm, a, I'm born in Britain, but I'm a, kind of, uh, I'm a kind of first generation migrant. I happen to be born in Britain, but I actually lived out of Britain for ages and then came back. And my sense of belonging to Britain is quite strong. And so although I want to protest at all kinds of wrongs, I don't want to have the collateral damage to British institutions and what I, what I regard as, 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 as um, profound and, and progressive values in Britain. Mm -hmm. The word progressive, I mean, it's been thrown around and, and in, it, it's not clear who is progressive and who's not progressive in this. I think Eric would probably agree with that if I can say, mm -hmm. say that. So there's a lot going on. So second generation migrants will have a different perspective. And the third generation may just feel that they, because they've been treated badly, and migrants are often treated badly for all the reasons that we understand, they just have the right to protest. And, and if they knock important symbols, which are in a David Miller sort of sense, you know, societally useful, that's just bad luck. Um, so I'm gonna turn to David for you're, you've joined us and you have a chance to intervene. So there, there are two questions at the table, one about whether we're seeing some of these um, debates really through zero sum lenses when, when they're not, when most of, the, most of the debates and discussion, we've picked up on that earlier, but it might be helpful to hear your word about, about it. And, and this question, which in a, in a, had all kinds of complexities, but in a abbreviated version is, is are, are we really talking about majority, minority, or are we talking about struggles over power? Yeah. Um, yeah, sorry, I'm late. I made a mistake of driving. Um, <laughs> um, I, I think I mean, the, the thing that interests me um, is, and it, it is rather well timed to happen. We just had two days ago, we had the latest census results. Um, would show arguably actually uh, an acceleration in the um, in the growth of the ethnic minority population in the UK. Uh, the white British population that uh, we may we may talk about this earlier, but yeah, less than three quarters now, down to seventy four percent. Probably means that in looking at school age, school age British people. Probably two thirds of white British, third of a minority, um, mostly visible minority, but many of them white minorities. Um, so it's, and you had um, um, you know, Nigel Farage tweeting about the growth of, uh, of more majority minority towns. In the UK, Sajid Javid replying, so what? Uh, that Leicester, Bradford, Luton, Birmingham, uh, and now majority minority. I mean, I think, um, uh, as it happened, I think Nigel Farage got his <coughs> numbers slightly mixed up um, in what he was talking about. But I think for Sajid Javid to say, so what, um, is extraordinarily complacent, really. Um, I think, um, and I mean, the thing that really interests me is the the kind of common interest, you know, the kind of mutual regard that, you know, the, as it were, the, the best side of, you know, the sort of positive aspects of, of nationalism and national identity, what extent those are going to be able to be sustained in societies that don't have ethnic majorities. I mean, there are lots of examples in history where I guess it, um, there, has, there have been you know, lots of countries which haven't really had ethnic majorities. Um, but there haven't ever been, it's probably true to say, there haven't been countries in which, um, which have kind of gone through the kind of industrialization, the getting rich process, that have welfare states, that have you know, rule of law, you know, the kind of modern rich liberal democracies. Um, 
have pretty much all been cut through with ethnic majorities. And that, you know, how can you sustain the common interest that you require to, um, and I mean, you know, we've got this wonderful living example, living laboratory of, sort of Sweden and Denmark, you know, when it comes to the, the kind of solid, solidarity, diversity tension, uh, you know, both of them starting in more or less the same place in the, in the early 90s, very homogeneous, very egalitarian Scandinavian countries, uh, already experiencing a fair amount of, of um, immigration then. Um, and I mean, through the 90s, I think the Danes became kind of more and more um, hostile to it and have ended up with a very integrationist, uh, but a very restrictive immigration, very, uh, very integrationist policy. The Swedes, on the other hand, as we all know, went for a much more open uh, immigration policy and a much more kind of separatist multiculturalism. multiculturalism. Of course, that, they're now doing a handbrake turn on that and they're gonna, they're trying to go Danish, you know, right. 25 years too late, possibly. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, um, and I think it is interesting, you know, you look at unemployment benefit in Sweden, used to be one of the most generous in Europe, now one of the least generous in Europe. Now there are other reasons for that to do with kind of the, Things that happen with Swedish corporatism, um, and it's not entirely to do with that, but that, you know, whether, um, you know, whether this shift um, towards, I mean, what, you know, the white British will be a minority, what, by 2017? Uh, so, I mean, you know, so none of us are going to be around, but, you know, we, you know, how is that going to affect the sense of national solidarity and part of the same story and all the things that do kind of underpin? Um, you know, welfare yeah. states. It's not just a sense of solidarity, as you're pointing out, the, the kind of institutionalized benefits of, of a welfare state mm. that, that, that have been built upon that solidarity, that has solidarity is channeled. So, yeah. um, so we're coming close to time, so I want to give everyone else a final word. I'm sorry, David, that you're trying to yeah, late. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, at Yui, either these questions or, you know, or, or, and, Closing words. Well, it is about power and it is about distribution. I think also David uh, mentioned it. I, I have this uh, feeling that we are really coming to the point where we have to think our rethink our political theory, not theory of democracy, partly because things David said and things we have said here before. We had some presumptions about how political life was going to work. And I think the biggest shock we have, not only in terms of uh, nationalism, is uh, that uh, this assumption that things will just proceed the way they were is now being refuted. And the world is not going to be similar to what we have anticipated. And that creates a lot of insecurity. Insecurity breeds a lot of you know, fear and threat and so on. But it also demands that I think we'll think a little bit ahead of time. Our democracy was built in terms of, um, in, 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 as an attempt to answer questions that are maybe less relevant and do not answer questions that are becoming more relevant. So it's a bad time for the world and a great time for theory. <laughs> <laughs> Eric, let me turn to you next so I can give Rudis, our editor, fearless <laughs> editor, the final word. Yeah, yeah, no, just just very quickly on the on the material side. I don't think this is predominantly a materialist issue. I, I think a great survey question is: Do you think uh, pressure on public services is a big issue on a zero to one hundred? And in Britain, it's about a fifty. All you have to do is drop two words: immigrants putting pressure on public services. It goes up to seventy, which doesn't make any sense. From the size of the problem, must be that's caused by immigrants must be smaller than the total. Pro so, I mean, I, I, so what I think is is, and, and again, all the survey evidence would show that it's predominantly about identity, psychology, and culture, and not uh, material factors. The, the last thing I'd say is just in terms of looking ahead. You know, there are a number of, of countries that don't have ethnic majorities. And if we're thinking about places like Guyana and Belize and, and a number of these societies, they'll, it seems that you'll either get politics coming along ethnic lines. And in this country, Northern Ireland is the place that doesn't have the ordinary left-right politics. It's got more ethnic politics because of its ethnic configuration, I would argue. Um, or what seems to be occurring in Western countries, again, I think is this extreme cultural ideological polarization in which it's not about minority versus majority, but it is about 
attitudes towards race as the dividing line. So views on is the US a racist country, support for Black Lives Matter and all these sorts of things, these sort of racially tinged but not actual racial issues. And I think I would predict a sort of rising polarization along these sorts of ideological fronts as the societies get more diverse. Good, okay. the last word. <laughs> yeah, final word. I mean, uh, thanks everybody for, uh, for interesting questions. Um, I do wanna uh, react also to the, the question about power because I think it's a very important one and it's, it connects this book to some other books uh, like books written by David, for instance, uh, but also a book uh, that I did with some um, Berlin colleagues, uh, which appeared also with uh, Cambridge University Press in 2019. It's called The Struggle Over Borders, and it deals with, with immigration, uh, um, um, liberalization of markets or neoliberalism, and Europeanization or, de, um, uh, or supranationalization more in general as two, as three uh, components of the emergence of a new political cleavage between what we call cosmopolitans and communitarians, like you call the, the somewheres and the anywheres, I think. Um, and, uh, and that also plays a role in this majority-minority uh, 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 discussion. It is not, uh, it is about power, but it's not um, necessarily, and in the first place, also, it's also about that, but not, I don't think even in the first place, about uh, cultural my majority uh, using symbolic issues to maintain its dominance over minorities. It is also a cleavage within the majority, that's what you refer to also, you, you say, you label it in terms of cultural left. I think it is much broader than that. Uh, it is it is um, um, about neoliberal elites. Also, um, much of much of these policies are also pushed by uh, by big firms, for instance, by international corporations, by uh, Silicon Valley, uh, etc. So it's not just the cultural left. It is highly educated people more generally. Again, a book by uh, David uh, recently. Um, it is center versus periphery. Uh, it is middle class versus lower class because these the, the claims for maintenance of majority rights they come most strongly not from the big cities. They come from the periphery. They come most strongly not from the middle classes. You know the the carrier of nationalism in the nineteenth century. No, it is it is lower classes and lower middle classes, often in the periphery indeed. Uh, and, and on the other side, we find representatives of the highly educated intellectual classes in alliance with, with international uh, business and often in, in alliance that relates to the earlier question of the gentleman who left about the Sikh community. It is often middle class representatives of migrants and minority communities that also not necessarily always represent uh, the, the large bulk of these mi uh, migrant communities. So it is a lot about power. I think that is something that is that this book doesn't really deal with very much. Uh, it is very much about the normative debate, but underlying this indeed um, are a lot of other books <laughs> that have been written and uh, that can be written. Okay, so um, let me just draw it to a close by, by thanking Rude and Liab and Absentia for bringing us together for, I think, a really interesting um, and important conversation this conversation is not going to stop here today. It's going to be a part of our future for, for quite a while to come to all of you for coming, but most of all to you for, for uh, coming and asking interesting questions. So just join me in thanking the panel. <laughs>